Welcome to the New Books Network. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the New Books in Science, Technology, and Society podcast, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Jake Chaninson, one of the hosts of the channel. Today we'll be talking with Danielle Citrin about her new book, The Fight for Privacy, Protecting Dignity, Identity, and Love in the Digital Age. Danielle Citrin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Danielle, I was wondering if you could begin the interview by telling us a bit about yourself and what led you to write this book. I've been writing about privacy since, golly, 2005. (laughs) Um, And, you know, as a law student, so so, uh, my interest in privacy doesn't begin as a legal academic, but I wrote, sadly, my my sort of journal note on Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So reproductive freedom and thinking about intimate privacy is something that I've been interested in for a really long time. But when I became a legal academic, my work first focused on different types of sort of amassing of sensitive information, whether it was biometric data, social security numbers. Um, and I, my first book was about cyber stalking. Um, it's called Hate Crimes in Cyberspace. And one of the strategies of cyber stalking is privacy violations, and in particular, intimate privacy violations, um, the posting of nude photos without permission. Um, and as I, my scholarship evolved and my advocacy work evolved, um, we began, so I um, helped found the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, which um, began as an organization to help combat um, non-consensual intimate imagery. And um, we started, I started writing about the, uh, not the criminalization of non-consensual intimate imagery, working with lawmakers. Um, when we first, when I first started writing about it in 2013, there were three states that criminalized the practice. And um, when we founded CCRI, sort of our idea was that we would sort of a, change the narrative around it rather than revenge porn, but ways of thinking of how its privacy was being violated. And then now, here we are, 2022, there are 48 states DC and two territories that criminalize the practice. So, you know, I've been working as an advocate. Um, my scholarship has been sort of focused on thinking about why intimate privacy is special, why it deserves special protection. Um, so when I say the term intimate privacy, it's the way we manage the boundaries around our intimate lives. So it's information about and access to our bodies, our health, our innermost thoughts, which of course we document all day long. As we search, we browse, we share, we read um, our sexual orientation and sexual activity, gender, and our closest relationships. Um, And while you might think, oh gosh, of course, intimate privacy is, is, you know, the privacy around our intimate lives is something that we ought to protect. Um, It is woefully underprotected in the law. So the the book and a a series of articles leading up to, to the book, The Fight for Privacy, is about why we should care about intimate privacy. Why, in my lights, it's a moral right. It's a it's a human right and should be understood as a civil right. And why companies, governments, and individuals are violating it with far too little law in the way to protect against it. Sure, and thank you. So, taping just a quick step back here, you've given us a very helpful definition for what, I'm, as far as I'm aware, you've coined intimate privacy as uh, data relating to your personal life, your health data, your sexual orientation data, your wants, your desires, your fears, your innermost, most private thoughts. I was wondering, how does that relate to what you call in these books privacy invaders? What are privacy invaders, and how do they invade our privacy to get at this intimate data? Uh, individuals, you know, that's the, in, in chapter two of the book and in, in a lot of my advocacy work, what we've seen is that people, everyday people, um, invade others, pierce the boundaries of, of our intimate lives in ways that are deeply unwelcome. So, you know, intimate privacy can involve the, you know, secretly recording someone up your skirt or down their blouse, placing, you know, a hidden camera in a public bathroom. Um, So what we might call video voyeurism. It involves sextortion, which is, you know, taking someone's nude photo um, and then using it to extort more. Um, It's deep fake sex videos. So when we manipulate images to make you look like you're engaged in sex acts, which you are in, and the non-consensual posting of intimate imagery. Um, so, you know, individuals, it's mostly, so I have to say the, the phenomenon is so not a U.S. phenomenon. When individuals violate others' intimate privacy, it is the story of the United States is the story of Singapore. 
It's the story of South Korea. It's the story of Israel. It's the story of Iceland and Australia. Um, and more often or not than not, the perpetrators are male. Though the women, of course, and girls can be perpetrators as well. Um, and more often than not, the victims are female, non-white, and often gender and sexual minorities. Um, the the sort of um, so the impact has a it has a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable among us, uh, and it's life altering. So privacy invaders, um, there whether it's secretly taping you in a hotel room and then posting the videos on porn sites, um, whether it is um, someone who you know pretends to be you know a young person interested in you and coaxes you to turn over a nude photo, and then as it turns out. The, the, then the demand is you need to send me more videos. We need to say, you need to send me videos of your masturbating or I'm going to send this to your parents and post it online. Um, you know, it is, it is so often the case that, you know, the, the people who it affects, um, it is like an incurable disease victims have explained to me, you know, it, it undermines your sense of, you know, autonomy and how you present yourself to the world. It is, smashing of your sort of self-esteem and, and how others view you. You become like an object. You're no longer, you know, a fully integrated person. You're sadly speaking a vagina online um, or, you know, your genitals or breasts. Um, and it costs you your jobs, right? People can't get and can't keep jobs when, you know, the their online CV contains the suggestion they're interested in sex, their nude images, um, and, and other types of intimate privacy violations. So it's individuals who are determined privacy violators. Um, and sometimes their activity can, of course, be the handmaiden of governments. You know, Rana Ayub is a journalist in India who had expo- exposes the human rights abuses of the Modi regime. And, you know, she went on BBC and she did a lot of criticism of the Modi regime, but the sort of final straw was when she went on BBC and, and prominently critiqued the Modi regime for its human rights abuses, and in particular against the Muslim community of which she's a part. Um, and she got a text message like seconds before her phone starts blowing up. And the text message was from her source in the Modi regime. And the source said, check your Twitter account. Um, you, you'll see what's coming. And there was a video of her that looked like she was engaged in a sex act. She never engaged in that sex act, but the Modi regime saw it to silence her with a, what we call a deep fake sex video. Um, it was within 48 hours on half the phones in India. Um, there were death and rape threats. She was doxxed. Her Twitter feed was filled with obscenities and the suggestion that she was available for sex. And she stopped writing for about six months. Um, she has not, so this happened in April, 2018. She has not written for an Indian outlet since. She now writes for the Washington Post. She's actually in Chicago as a Pritzker fellow at the Institute of Politics right now. Um, it is, it was life shattering, um, terrorizing, so that the privacy invaders can often, you know, work on behalf of governments, not necessarily just the, you know, the the embittered ex or the stranger who places a hidden video camera in your in a public bathroom and then streams it online. Um, it can also be at the hands of governments. Sure. And and throughout all of this, there's a a common thread of technology sort of as a force multiplier. Instead of me uh, with my old fashioned camera, taking a couple pictures and getting them developed, uh, which is a limited number, it's a digital file. So it can be seeded and distributed far and wide. What role do large tech companies or platforms pay, uh, excuse me, play in uh, enabling these privacy invaders? So because digital tools enable sort of the viral spread of of intimate images and other kinds of intimate information. The the technology itself ensures, like it it exacerbates the harm. It means that it can be dispersed further and wider and reach wider audiences and immediately. Um, And we certainly know that content platforms um, are the enablers, right, of this kind of abuse. And there are 9,500 sites whose raison d'etre is the abuse of intimate imagery. So they have the most uncreative names you've ever heard. Hidden cam, hidden camera, video voyeur, Mr. Deepfake sex videos. Um, 
And most of these sites are hosted in the United States um, or Russia. And the reason why um, is because why, why is the United States so welcoming? You might say like, you know, I thought we were um, a, a nation of laws. Um, in 1996, Congress passed the Communications Decency Act. Now, we can pause and say the word decency for a moment. Let's like hold it there, right? Decency, the idea behind the law was basically to criminalize porn, which now I think seems totally absurd. Here we are in 2022. Most of the statute is struck down, but the one provision that remains in the ruins of the Communications Decency Act is Section 230. And, and the title of that statute is Good Samaritan Blocking and Filtering of Offensive Content. So it's Congress's words, not mine. And, and the idea was to provide an incentive for platforms to, mon- to self-monitor because Congress knew there's just no chance, this is 1996, that companies would be able to kind of, that um, sorry, that federal agencies could address all of the abuse on their own. And courts have construed the provision in such an overbroad fashion that, so this is the words of the part of the statute that, that I'm going to talk about. It says, no um, interactive computer service will be treated as a publisher or speaker of information provided by another information content provider. Now, it's in, initially drafted to respond to the notion that if you're trying to clean up the internet, um, we're not going to treat your the defamation that you don't find and take down as the publisher of that defamation. Um, that's the, like sort of the original test case that causes Ron Wyden and Chris Cox to team up and write this part of the statute. Um, but it's been interpreted in such a broad fashion that even sites that encourage, solicit, or keep up intimate privacy violations, they get to enjoy the immunity from liability. Um, so the worst of the worst actors are enjoying this immunity. So that's why we have these 9,500 sites who their business model, they're often subscription-based, like $29.99 a month. They're part of their business as well is the collection and exploitation and sharing and sale of people's intimate data, so the subscribers' data. Um, and there's nothing victims can do, right? They can't sue these sites when they've tried to. The sites get to say, well, go for it. You know, try to sue me. Uh, you'll find out that having spent money on lawyers' fees was a useless proposition, and they're, they're right. Um, courts have fine sites, some sites like Texan, with three X's in the title, .com, immune from responsibility. Um, so platforms pay, content platforms play a huge role. Um, in enabling and soliciting this really destructive abuse. Sure. So something that comes to mind for me is around the same time, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, was enacted in the late 90s. And so if I post, uh, I don't know, uh, my favorite show hypothetically is uh, an old Tom and Jerry cartoon that is still with under copyright on Twitter, Twitter may ask me to take that down or may take it down forcibly if the copyright owner you know, becomes alerted. So if I post oh, sensitive it information, will, it will literally be gone without you having to say a word. Thanks to content ID software filtering. So the, the we we uh, we cherish you know copyright protection. So, uh, but women's bodies not so much. Right. So, uh, but that was actually where my question was going. Is so intellectual property has more rights on the internet than women's bodies. You're damn straight. Right. That's so, very, so that very is, upsetting. Yeah. You know, the DMCA, so, so Section 230 of the Decency Act has exemptions, a few narrow exemptions. And one of them is federal intellectual property law. So that includes, of course, the Copyright Act, which allows notice and takedown um, and then enables you to sue a copyright violator if you don't take it down. Right. So what's interesting and devastating at the same time is unlike the movie or, you know, the media industry, which... Um, can and often impart, you know, um, that the content ID filtering software will immediately take down that episode of Tom and Jerry or of a recent movie. Like you just will not see it. Um, sometimes women themselves have taken these photos um, and can claim copyright in these photos. They'll go to sites and say that, listen, I took that picture myself. My ex betrayed my trust and posted it here online. And so what most of these sites do is just say, sue me. And what they realize is that most victims don't have the money to bring a lawsuit. 
So unlike movie, TV, media, heavily resourced, you know, companies um, that, you know, the, the content is taken down immediately or if filtered right away. Um, sure. So that naturally DMCA is the question. DMCA is not an oh, sorry, available tool. No, no, it's just DMCA is an unhelpful tool, though. You know, most of the cases, the photos are not taken by the women themselves. Um, but in the case that it is, it's also not even effective measure. I understand. So should Section 230 be amended? And if so, how? Section 230 needs to change. So I've been writing about sort of proposals for reform since 2008. And when I first wrote about um, and argue that platforms should have a duty of care um, to take reasonable steps to address illegality, my goodness, was that unpopular. (laughs) This is 2008. uh, And this very notion that we would have liability for online abuse was like a heretical concept. Um, that, you know, the internet shall not be touched. And I was the enemy of the First Amendment. Now, the sort of interesting evolution of the way in which, you know, ideas develop is that the more obvious I was writing about harm sort of early on in my career, like cyberstalking. Um, And at the time, people said to me, ah, it's not a big deal. There's only so many people are kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. But as the abuse became more pervasive, as the harms became irrefutable and obvious, and then in empirically shown, um, the conversation around Section 230 has shifted from thou shalt not touch it to kind of interestingly, like, um, and I'll explain my proposal, but but sort of bipartisan agreement that it needs to be changed, though the agreement is not, there is an incoherency because there's disagreement about how and what is the problem, <laughs> right? So you've got conservative folks saying the problem is the that companies are allowed to take down my speech that I like um, and, you know, not face liability for having taken down my speech. Now, we can talk about whether there would even be a cause of action for such a thing, right? Because these are private companies and these are their platforms, right? Um, And on the other hand, um, sort of the Democrats suggest the problem, and I'm with them, that uh, the overbroad interpretation of 230 means that abuse is left up that ruins people's lives, that silences them and drives them offline. So I have um, a new article coming out in BU Law Review in which I refine my proposal to change and reform Section 230. So we would carve out the kind of worst of the worst actors. Um, So sites that encourage, that solicit, or keep up intimate privacy violations or cyber stalking content, they just do not, they and ought not enjoy immunity from responsibility. Right. Okay. So that, those bad Samaritans, they don't even get to come to the table. Um, but all other sites have a duty of care to take reasonable steps to address um, intimate privacy violations, violations, and cyber stalking content. And I, pers- in my article, rather than leaving it to courts to figure out what the reasonable steps are, I've worked with companies for 12 years on trust and safety. Um, and we know what reasonable steps look like. So I lay out in the article the kinds of steps that companies should take um, to demonstrate that they're engaging in that duty of care um, to address life-altering, changing, destroying intimate privacy violations and cyberstalking. Sure. And what would the enforcement mechanism on this sort of thing look like? Is it another amendment to a privacy policy where they let the users know that now we're doing X, Y, and Z to keep your data safe? Is it something the government's doing? Is it something that me as a personal citizen, am I exercising what's called a private right of action for our listeners at home? That means that I, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, can sue a company if they have wronged me and seek of some sort of like financial damages. So how the, um, how the clarification and amendment to Section 230 would play out is if you're um, an individual who's faced intimate privacy violations um, or content that amounts to cyber stalking, you can bring claims against the platform. So let's just imagine the claims are um, negligent enablement of crime, public disclosure of private fact, there are various privacy torts, and the defendant. Um, could raise um, in its motion to dismiss and say, look, I'm immune from responsibility because I 
content platform, uh, I take all those steps that are laid out in the statutes, those reasonable steps. You know, I have a, a process of reporting. I immediately take down um, abuse that is identified as intimate privacy violations. And what the court would have to do is then hear, and there would be discovery, factual discovery, on the question of whether the platform did indeed take those reasonable steps and, um, and then apply and a jury would apply those facts. So you couldn't, uh, uh, right now defendants can simply move to dismiss without any discovery, without any fact finding. They just have to say section 230. And if the case doesn't involve intellectual property or the electronic communications privacy act or the knowing facilitation of sex trafficking, the suit is dismissed without any discovery, without any answer of the complaint. Um, and what my amendment would do would, would be allow victims to bring their cases against platforms um, and to press their claims for harm and for redress for those harms against those platforms. And if platforms wanted to avail themselves of that legal shield, they'd have to prove it, that they warranted, that they took those reasonable steps that are laid out in the statute. And then juries would assess that, what we call an affirmative defense, at trial. So it's not, when you say a private right of action, the statute itself wouldn't provide a way to, um, a mechanism for liability, but rather it would condition the immunity provision that's being invoked by companies when they face common law claims or statutory claims. And instead of just dismissing the case, then defendants would have to, content platforms would have to show that they deserve it, that they've earned it. Um, And so, and that, and victims would have their, a day in court in the way that they do not now. Gotcha. So taking a step back from Section 230 and looking at intimate privacy more broadly, um, what would comprehensive federal privacy law look like, right? If uh, our privacy is continually being violated uh, every day by these privacy invaders and by these platforms, uh, would some sort of uh, privacy law applying to all people in all sectors be useful? Yeah. So, and, and to be clear, the sort of agenda that I lay out in the book isn't just content platforms, right? But it's companies, everyday companies, your Alexa in your kitchen, your Fitbit, your period tracking app, your dating app, um, all the ways, all these tools and services are phones, right? Collecting location data and health data, uh, our visits to WebMD and the, all the information that's collected about all of our browsing on adult sites. I'm just giving some examples. Um, all of that information right now is woefully underprotected. So long as companies tell us in their privacy policies hidden away on a website that they are collecting information and sharing it, so long as they're not lying to us, they can do it. And so we need a comprehensive approach um, to individual privacy invaders to companies, so Spying Inc. is what I call them in the book, and to to government agencies, um, collecting, using, sharing, amassing, exploiting our intimate data. Um, And I argue in the book that we should understand intimate privacy as a civil right, not just a fundamental human right that we deserve and that government shouldn't violate, but a civil right that, and by, by which I mean a legal right that everyone enjoys, that can't be given away without a really good reason. Um, so it's just when you call something a civil right, you, you would say that right means that it's not good enough to say, hey, it's really profitable to sell this data. It's not good enough to say I'm going to collect it because it makes you know things more efficient to know more about our citizens. And it's certainly not good enough to say, as so many per- individual privacy invaders do, I just did it for fun, right? I didn't mean to hurt the person. I'm just showing off to my friends. So I can't possibly be held responsible. And when you shift our thinking from, you know, a consumer protection approach, which is where we're at right now, to a civil right, what that means is that anyone that comes in, you know, that collects, uses, shares, and has some access to our intimate lives, they become the stewards, the guardians of intimate data. So it would mean like just consider platforms, right? Platforms would, the content platforms that we were talking about, those 9,500 sites, the, the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know, all the social media companies, that they would become the guardians of our intimate data, not to exploit it, right? They would have to treat it with care, confidentiality, 
loyalty and a commitment to anti-discrimination. Um, it would shift the focus right from often like in individual privacy cases, you know, the, so often law enforcement looks at the problem and says, ah, you know, it's your fault. You shared this nude photo with this person. What did you expect? Right. So often victims are blamed. When you shift the focus from kind of in an individual privacy invader and sort of see the structural damage, um, it would help us, I think, convince lawmakers to have a comprehensive approach to intimate privacy violations. Right now, we just deal with them. They're, they're mostly misdemeanors. We look at them like in, in silos. So we don't see the connection between video voyeurism, sextortion, deep fake sex videos, non consensual intimate imagery. In fact, some a lot of this is unprotected by law at all. That is, there is no criminal statute to address deep fake sex videos or upskirt photos and down blouse photos. And, and we need a comprehensive approach that recognizes that what's at stake is not only people's privacy, but their equal opportunity, right? So privacy and equality are the same story. That is, without intimate privacy, we can't, so often marginalized people can't make the most out of all of their life opportunities. Um, and crucially, civil rights and liberties are on the line. So the more, you know, when an individual is facing assault online, when their nude photos, right, are, are posted and shared on Gab, on Telegram, right, uh, uh, on various websites, um, it is impossible to engage in speech, right? So often victims tell me that they completely shut down all their accounts. It's ways that, you know, their perpetrators have access to them. They, they turn off LinkedIn, even though it's professionally pretty important for them. They shut down all of their social media profiles, which helps them stay in contact with their friends, like Instagram, Snapchat, you know, Facebook. Um, and it, it makes it impossible not only to work and to live and to date, but also to speak, right, to engage with the world around you. And a civil rights agenda helps us see the significance of this moral right to intimate privacy and it helps provide a practical kind of a framework because we know your know, workplace educators public accommodations and public you know the all the public transportation right they're viewed as the guardians of our important opportunities right and they owe us duties to make sure that they're free from hostile environments or that people are accommodated and can use these let's say just take public transportation, for example, right? They're the guardians of people's important experiences. And I think we ought to understand companies, content platforms, governments, and individuals as the guardians of our intimate data as well. Sure. So if uh, companies, uh, probably a subset or maybe an exact set of what you identified as spying inc- are guardians of our data and need to trade it responsibly, does it mean that a portion of the solution to this problem is a technological solution? Industry norms absolutely play a role. Um, But when, what Congress would have to do is pass a statute. I mean, certainly state lawmakers could do it too, but we need a comprehensive um, civil right to intimate privacy that's has um, embedded in law, right? And and a civil right to intimate privacy and, and, and ensuring that companies and individuals and governments have this, you know, honor their guardianship duties, you know, there would be, what, what that would mean is you would need a really good reason to collect intimate data, right? It would have to be strictly necessary for you to provide a, a product or service, um, or right? Um, and it would mean that you would have duties of loyalty, so you can't exploit data for your own purposes. It has to be in the consumer individual's interest. You have to be, have a duty of confidentiality, and of anti-discrimination. And I think crucially, uh, a civil right to intimate privacy would mean you can't sell that data, period, the end of story, right? Right now, our information economy is sort of driven by when information is is shared with one site, then, then it is presumed that you've said, okay, cool, you can share it everywhere and it can be exploited and then you know shared with ten the 4,000 data brokers. And no one's actually ever consented to that model, right? It has just been one we presumed and lawmakers have not stepped in. They've had opportunities to step in. Um, We have a really interesting law called the American um, Data Protection and Privacy Act that got out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee on a bipartisan basis. 
Uh, I wish we would pass it in the lame duck. It understands privacy as a civil right. It, um, it, it adopts a lot of my proposals in the book. Um, co- colleagues at EPIC, uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, of which I'm the director of, of the chair, chair of the board, um, Ellen Butler and Katrina Fitzgerald made sure that intimate information would, pro- would enjoy special protection um, and prevent the sale, as well as have a commitment to, to anti-discrimination, which would not include having to show motive or intent Right. So if there's a disparate impact on vulnerable communities, that that then would be violated. So um, I'm not in fantasy land. <laughs> it's always nice to know what you write isn't completely off the chain. Right. You know, wrote that, wrote the book and it came out in October. It's been encouraging to see some of the ideas in the book, um, you know, make their way into proposals that that are actually being embraced. So so I have some hope that this one never knows, right? That this work, um, as we've seen in the case of non-consensual intimate imagery and it's, you know, criminalization, I'd like to see this broader agenda be put into practice and passed into federal law. Sure. And so that's about all the time we have. Um, on the way out, I wanted to ask, uh, leave you with one more question for our listeners at home, um, being that while we're not quite in the world where intimate privacy is protected just yet, since this bill hasn't been passed, but what can everyday listeners do to protect their intimate privacy in sort of the world that we live in right now? Right. You know, people always want tips and and self-help is a really difficult thing, right? But I think that what we can all do is educate the people in our lives about intimate privacy and respecting each other's right? Because it's only as effective as we can teach people about its importance to agency and to dignity and to love, right? We, we, can, we can begin the evangelizing ourselves, right? Um, we can bring our moral case to companies. They can, of course, choose to ignore us, right? Uh, but I would say that there are some small things one can do, you know, covering your camera on your computer, but they're so small as to almost, I want to say, like self-help ain't doing it. So I don't want us to think that we can fix this ourselves. We can't. Sure. Well, thank you very much for spending the time to talk with us. You bet. My pleasure.